Good evening and welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Let's all stand together and sing number 626, The Lily of the Valley. Amen. What a wonderful way to begin our Sunday night service, particularly on a day cut out just for napping, right? I uh, hope you got one in. I got a 15-minute one in this afternoon, and it felt pretty good. I might just go with you all night. No, I won't do that. It is good to see you. I hope that you have had just a precious day in the Lord. Uh, so many of you have already done your homework, you took your exam, filled out the survey for me, folded it up, and put it in the box out there when you're going out the doors over to the left. I do need to tell you this, though. I designed this survey uh, over a decade ago and have used it to help several churches, and I left a question on there, the one that was ready for you this morning, that, that won't count. Aren't you always glad when you take an exam, the professor says, number 10, number 15, or whatever, does not count. You get free credit for that. So there is one question. I've, I've printed the correct one now, and it's out there. So anybody picks them up from now on through will get the right one. But uh, there, there's one on there from this morning that does not count. So thank you so much for doing that. Well, listen. We're going to take up the offering in just a moment, and so ushers are coming and preparing to do that. But I want to introduce my special friend to you tonight. One of the great things that God uh, allows me to do in this season of life and ministry is to teach at the Bible College down at Clear Creek in Pineville. And Zeke Pinnock is not only a student of mine, but he has me for three classes this semester. So bright and early on Tuesday mornings, he's in my spiritual formation class. And then on Tuesday afternoons, he's in my spiritual, wait, church revitalization class. And then uh, on Wednesday mornings, I teach uh, a family and discipleship class. And every time I look out over that group of students, Mr. Zeke is right there. So Zeke, Thank you for coming to Bible Baptist. Get on up here, buddy, and lead us in prayer. Hey, why don't you 
tell the church a little bit about yourself first, okay. all right? And then lead us in prayer and ask God's blessings on our offering tonight. All right. I'll answer the first question I get asked 90% of the time when I meet somebody new, and that's where I'm from. I was born in West Tennessee, grew up mostly in North Central Texas, and right now home for me is West Kentucky. But I praise the Lord that he's called me there to Clear Creek Baptist Bible College where I can learn and prepare for whatever God has in store for my life in the days ahead. I don't know. God does, and that's all that matters. But I'm so thankful for Brother Allen, and I believe y'all understand how special he is. And I thank the Lord for the way that God uses all of us. Uh, not just one person here, another person there, but God will use all of us if we would just surrender our life to Him and His will. But let's pray as we've gathered here this evening to worship the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love that you have for us. And God, as, as we've all gathered here, our, our lives are, are different in so many ways as we have different backgrounds, different things that we've dealt with today, this last week. But God, one thing is true for all of us, and that is your love for us. And Father, I pray that also would, would be true for all of us, that we would all be your children that are gathered here. But if there be one, Father, that isn't your child, Father, pray that you begin working on their heart and life um, to convict and draw them with your Holy Spirit. As we have this time of offering, God, I thank you that you just call us to give joyfully from our hearts and that we can just worship you in that manner. Lord, thank you for the singing, Lord. We ask your anointing and the movement of your Holy Spirit at this time. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for his glory. Amen. Amen.
Well, let's all stand together. We're going to sing number 685, Footsteps of Jesus. some word of prayer before uh, Brother Allen comes. Our most precious heaven, Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for being blessed and stoned to you today. Lord, most of all, we thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, Lord. So we ask you to forgive us for our sins in our short time, Lord. We ask you to be for the hour he brings the message to us. May we be able to thank you and use it in our everyday life to tell others about God's glory. Lord, we ask you to be with the nation, set the heart of the people that may come to you. Lord, we ask you to be another leader that may also be you here to receive and believe this country. Lord, we ask you to be with the uh, one cloth that this Lord has set their hearts that they may be talking and be able to, use, to turn to you. Lord, we ask you again to watch over the table and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight, as we started last Sunday night, we will be looking at the 23rd Psalm. So. I invite you to turn there with me again, Psalm number 23. Now, Zeke, these people know me as a meek and mild pastor. So if any of them come up to you after the service and ask about what things are like in the classroom, turn around and go the other way. Hey, I like his answer, don't you? Uh, he surprised me tonight. So glad to have him. Let me just say this. Um, we're in good hands, and by that I mean... God has called out wonderful servants, and they're smarter than they've ever been. They really are. I mean that sincerely. 
Uh, I, I wish you'd come visit campus sometime down there and just see this young army of preacher boys and missionary girls and uh, all kinds of servants that God's going to use in His church in the years to come. Does my heart so good just to get to spend a little time with them. And honestly, I learn more from them than they learn from me. And so it's just a blessing to have that privilege in life. Psalm 23, as we continue to make our way through the 23rd Psalm, sort of phrase by phrase, verse by verse, each Sunday night until we're finished, we're going to read it all together. So uh, we'll start in verse 1, read down through verse 6, where the Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And I love this next part of the psalm, don't you? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for the 23rd Psalm. Thank you, Lord, for King David. Lord, we know him to be an anointed leader, a mighty warrior, but, but just a humble man who made mistakes. But we thank you, Lord, that according to your very word, he was a man after your own heart. And Father, we read that very clearly in this, his most famous psalm. And I just pray, Lord, that tonight you'd be with us as we continue to make our way through it. I pray that, Father, you would speak to us clearly and that, Lord, we would walk away from here saying together, it sure is good that you are our shepherd. I pray and I ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So last week, we really didn't get to wrap up the first installment in these messages through the 23rd Psalm. So let me give you just a very brief review of what we covered last week, and then we'll pick up where we left off. I told you that even though so many times Psalm 23 has been referred to as a psalm for the dying, in actuality, it's a psalm for the living. It's a psalm for those of us that God still has on this earth as we are progressing between the moment of our justification to the moment of our glorification. Justification when the Lord saved us, cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Glorification when He takes us into His very presence. In this particular part of life, we're walking through sanctification. We're learning to grow more, to look like our Savior Jesus Christ. And aren't we thankful that we have a guide in doing so? You know, God doesn't just save us and say, here you go, you're off on your own, muddle through life the best that you can. But God continues to be our shepherd. We were reminded last week that these first couple of verses really provide for us an antidote to an issue that we all face in life, and that is stress. I reminded you last week that there's a difference between stress and worry. Now, we're not talking tonight about the sin of worry, and we know that, right? Sin, worry, those things are synonymous. Worry is sin, because worry is when we allow the heaviness, the stress in life to make us look more at the situations of life than we look at our Savior. It's almost like Peter when he stepped out of the boat. We love that story, don't we? Peter saw Jesus walking on the water. Peter was the one who said, Lord, let me come out. Let me walk on the water with you. 
Peter did that. Imagine that. Not only was the Savior walking on the water, but so was Peter. But all of a sudden, Peter starts looking at the waves. He gets his eyes off of Jesus and onto his circumstances. And when he's bogged down with worry, that takes him down under the water. We're thankful for the rest of the story that Jesus picks him up. And Jesus carries him to safety. But that's what I'm saying to you tonight. When you look at the waves and you look at the issues that are stressful in life and you concentrate on them more than you concentrate on the Savior, that's when stress becomes worry. But we need help with our stress. We need an antidote for the stress that's in our life so that it doesn't tip over the scale and become worry. So the piece of advice that we need to take first of all from David in the 23rd Psalm is we need to remember whose we are. And so I strongly encourage you to start at first base in processing the 23rd Psalm. Remember that you belong to the Lord. Remember whose you are. The Lord is my shepherd. Consequently, I shall not want. Really, the remainder of the 23rd Psalm is quite useless to you unless you can say with David that the Lord is my shepherd. Aren't you thankful you can say that tonight? Not just that the Lord is God, but you can say that He is my God. He is my shepherd. We were reminded last week in the New Testament that Jesus looked at His apostles, and He has been recorded for us tonight as saying in John chapter 10, verse 11, that I am the Good Shepherd. One of those beautiful I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am the Good Shepherd, the shepherd who lays down His life for the sheep. And then He goes on in that same chapter to say that my sheep, Hear my voice, I know them, and they know me. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. We are held securely as His sheep in His hand. Nothing that happens in life, no circumstance of life, no spiritual power that we might face on earth, has the strength to take us out of the Lord's hand. I'm so thankful tonight that my salvation is eternally secure because my shepherd is the Lord. He's Almighty God. And so that's where we start with the 23rd Psalm. We remind ourselves whose we are. Tomorrow, you may wake up in the morning and it's a bad day. Have you ever had one of those days? You just wake up and it's a bad day from the beginning. And it only gets worse as the clock tick-tocks, tick-tocks, and every hour upon, ever, upon hour becomes uh, more difficult. Tomorrow may be just like that. And here's what you need to do on a day like that. Remember who you belong to. Remember that the most important thing in life for you as a believer has already been settled. You're His. He is yours. Remember whose you are. The second thing we started to learn last week, and we'll finish out and go into the third thing in just a few moments, but not only should we remember whose we are, but here David tells us to rely on His provisions. Rely on the provisions that your good shepherd gives you. Notice that David writes, and he says the first part of verse 2, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Beautiful picture that tells us that our lives as children of God don't have to be like the lives of people in the world. Now, some of you are going to go home tonight and watch whatever's left of the Super Bowl. And as you watch that, you're going to be bombarded with commercials. You know, there's a big deal with the Super Bowl and commercials. Did you know that? That's a big deal. 
And in a lot of those commercials, uh, people are going to be encouraged to look for certain things. That's why these companies spend billions of dollars. It's amazing how much money has been spent in production for commercials tonight and to purchase just a little slice of the airspace that's out there during the Super Bowl. But, but through all of that, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is there are things to sell. There are things to sell, and people are going to be encouraged in very creative ways to look for those things. It's almost going to be presented like this, that life can't be just what it ought to be unless you take in one of these things. Life could be so much better if you just bought this certain car, if you just drunk this certain beverage. Life would just be better. Well, the bottom line is this. Life is sweet because God gives us the provisions that we need. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. The world's going to tell you that you have to go, go, go until you're spent. The world's going to tell you that it's a rat race, that you have to step over and even on people to get to where you need to be. And you'll find yourself, if you're marching to the drumbeat of the world, you'll find yourself in this frenzied, mad pace. And you'll wear yourself out. And when God says all the time, I have some green pastures for you. What a beautiful picture of the peace, the rest that God gives. Aren't you thankful tonight that there is rest in the Lord. There's rest in Him. There's spiritual rest, and I would also submit to you tonight that there's physical rest. The worst type of weariness that you can engage is not really weariness of the body, but it's weariness of the mind. You ever been there? We had a great day yesterday, and I told some of you that I Looked forward to getting home last night just to lay back on our bed. We have a nice bed at our house. (laughs) Amy and I, uh, several months ago, went out and we we bought one of those uh, Sempurpedic, I think I'm saying that, Tempurpedic mattress that, you know, it has these little buttons and you can go up and you can go down. Every now and then I reach across and I grab her remote control. And if she's not sleeping just the way I want her to sleep, (laughs) I'll hit the button. I didn't tell you all that tonight. But anyway, we we really do, and we've enjoyed those. And I just thought to myself last night, you know, I'll get home and I'll be in that comfortable bed on that comfortable mattress. Uh, It has a zero gravity feature. It's fancy, I'm telling you. We're not fancy people, but we have a fancy mattress. And you can hit, hit that zero gravity feature, and it props your head up just the right way and your legs up just the right way. It just feels like you're floating on a cloud. And so I'd said to myself, when I get home, I'm going to hit that zero gravity feature, and it'll be just a moment, and I'll be out to, to my Z's, you know, out in la-la land. And I laid there, and I felt really good, but my mind would not shut off. It just kept going. Uh, Things that I need to do. I was thinking about my message this morning and everything. You know, all that stuff going on in the mind. And often, if we're not careful, that can mark not just one night, but many nights out of our lives when God says, I want to free you from that. So the same God that gives us spiritual peace, and spiritual rest, and we don't even know the best of it. I would recommend to you sometime, maybe even right now, if if you're not reading and studying a particular book of the Bible, read the book of Hebrews, one of my favorite books of the New Testament. And the Bible there says for us that there still remains a rest for the people of God. You know, we will see rest, complete, perfect rest 
one day, but we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to enjoy a little bit of that. And so sometimes we just need to say to the Lord, God, you have everything. You're infinite and I'm finite. You're omnipotent and I'm not. You can do all things and God, I'm very limited. And from our hearts, from our minds, we just need to say, God, I trust you. I can't figure this stuff out. And so, Lord, make my brain turn off. Help me just to leave the details to you. Of course, that's not a word that uh, excuses, you know, good, good plans or anything like that because God has given us the ability to plan and, and to make uh, strides in life. It's not that. But when we've done all we can, we just need to turn it off and say, God, you're my great shepherd, and I'm going to trust you for the provisions of my life. I'm going to lay down and just rest in you. That's what the sheep had to do. Don't forget it. I told you last week, I'll remind you occasionally as we go through the 23rd Psalm on Sunday nights that you have to sort of get into the mind of a sheep to understand this. David is writing from the perspective of a Bethlehem shepherd, and he's pulling out of those earlier experiences in his life, even though he's an old man when he writes this. And so we, we have to think like a shepherd and like a sheep to understand a lot of this. And, and the sheep needed that. The sheep needed the shepherd to bring them to a place where they would just lie down and they would rest. If the shepherd did not make them rest, they would get into a very bad spot. So the shepherd, he provides for us, he provides rest, and then obviously when we think about lying down in green pastures, we also think about nourishment. So our shepherd provides the nourishment that we need. That little phrase green pastures or lie down in green pastures, really that's saying that the shepherd takes us to pastures of tender grass. Grass that is good for us. Uh, so this obviously not only refers to the rest of the sheep, but it also refers to the food of the sheep. God gives us the spiritual nourishment that we need. I'm thankful for what the prophet Jeremiah wrote. You're familiar with these words. In Jeremiah 15, 16, he says, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. God grant it that we would be people who are fulfilled by your word. God's Word, eternal Word, words that leads us to spiritual health. May we find the Word of God and may we be well nourished in those tender pastures of grass. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119 verse 103, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Every now and then, maybe even tonight, if those commercials aren't what you need to see, turn it off and dive into the Word of God. Uh, tomorrow, in your spare moments, if the song you're listening to doesn't give you the spiritual nourishment that you need, God has it for you in His Word. I love what Ezekiel writes in Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 14 and 15. Just listen to these words. I will feed them with good pasture. That's God's promise to you. He says, I will feed you with good pasture. On the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. I wish I could just pick you up and take you up to what the area is that Ezekiel refers to here. The Golan Heights. If you ever look at a map of Israel and you see 
uh, the Jordan Valley coming down and emptying out into the Sea of Galilee and then coming out of the Sea of Galilee all the way down to the Dead Sea. Up in the northern part of the country, just east of the Sea of Galilee, just east of the Jordan River, is what's known as the Golan Heights. Beautiful area. It's an area that's fought over because whoever controls the Golan controls the security of that whole area. But you get up there on the Golan Heights, and it's just gorgeous. I mean, meadows, green grass, the best beef in Israel. We like a little red meat every now and then, right? The best beef in Israel are, are those grass-fed beef from up on the Golan. And that's exactly what Ezekiel is talking about here. Not down in the arid, rocky places where grass is spotty. Not down in those places where you can go from one patch of rocks to another and you just find these little areas of grass. We're talking about tableland. Beautiful land, grassy land. And Ezekiel says, I will feed them with good pasture on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land. On rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down declares the Lord God. I mentioned just briefly last week that there are different types of grasses, especially in a rocky, rugged land like Israel. Uh, there was what shepherds referred to as goat grass. You remember we said last week that goats can just about eat anything. You ever fooled with a goat? How many of you have raised goats? All right, a few of you have. Uh, goats can be a lot of fun, and then they can't be. <laughs> goats uh, are, are interest, interesting varmints, and they'll, they'll eat. I mean, you know, shepherding a goat is a lot different than shepherding sheep. I remember when uh, Amy and I went out to... Uh, East Kentucky, out in the middle of the mountains of East Kentucky, and I had an uncle that came over there, and it was a beautiful place, but where we lived, you know, we, we had a house, and then down from the street, you know, it just, just went down into a valley, and uh, somebody had done a good job of terracing that a little bit, but I remember my uncle Eugene, when he came and he looked at that, and he looked me in the eye, and he said, Alan, how you going to mow that? And I said, Uncle Eugene, very carefully. He said, you know what I'd do? I said, Uncle Eugene, what would you do? He said, I'd get a goat. In other words, get you a goat and let it keep that mode down for you. Well, I was actually living in the city limits and I couldn't have a goat. But anyway, goats, they'll do it. You put them on any kind of grass, they'll eat it. I guess they have a tough digestive system. And they're okay. Sheep are not that way. Sheep can't eat inferior grass. Sheep can't eat what they called the goat grass. The sheep had to have that tender pasture, the beautiful grass. And that's why even to this day, when you go over to that part of the world, you'll find these nomadic shepherds out tending these sheep and they're, they're free-range sheep, and the shepherd has to lead them from place to place to find the kind of grass that they can eat, and then to make them lie down and digest the good grass that the shepherd has led them to. And that's what God does for us. He, he gives us the tender grass of His Word. He gives us the provision that we need for rest so that not only can we consume the Word, but we can lie down and, and grow in the Word. The bottom line is this, we don't have to live 
in a rat race of life. That's not where God wants us. God wants us to live by trusting Him, taking in His Word, and relying on His provision of rest. Let me show you one more about Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2. If we're going to live life outside of stress that can tip over and become worry, we have to just receive His peace. As we rely on His provisions, we can receive the peace that only He can give. Now, as we're talking about peace, I want you to understand that for the person, there really are two types of spiritual peace. And you have to have one to get the other. Let me say it again. For any person, there are two types of spiritual peace, and you have to have one to get the other. The first is peace with God, and the second is the peace of God. Aren't you thankful, born-again believer, that you have peace with God. You do. You see, in life, outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible describes us as being at enmity with God. We've turned our backs on Him. We don't have the natural inclination to follow Him You can see it in these little children that we bring up. It's so amazing how that little baby can become a toddler and that toddler can become an insane two-year-old. I remember we took our oldest son to the doctor, pediatrician, when he was two-year-old and we had some questions about some things that were going on. He said, just understand this, two-year-olds are crazy people. And we understand that. But I'll say this. Whoever came up with the terminology, the terrible twos, evidently didn't lead their children through the threes. <laughs> right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are living there right now. You get it very, very well. The point is this. We have to do all kinds of things to correct our children and to turn them the right way, but we don't have to teach them to be sinners. Do we? That's the natural inclination of our lives. That's who we are. Genetically, that's who we are. You see, we are sinners by choice, yes. But you need to know this, we're sinners by birth. The same David who wrote the 23rd Psalm said that in sin he was conceived... That didn't mean he had an illegitimate uh, conception. It just simply meant this, that his mama was a sinner and his daddy was a sinner and he too was a sinner. That's the way it is. We are sinners by birth. Ever since Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, every generation of humanity, humanity from one to the next all the way down to us tonight have been Sinners, original sin, passed down through the generations. So we're sinners by birth, and then we become sinners by choice. Did you have to teach your little boy or your little girl to tell that first lie? No. Did you have to teach that little boy or that little girl to be selfish? Mine! Right? That's who we are. And because of that, and because of the fact that more than anything else, God is holy. Because God is supremely holy, and because we're altogether sinful, there's enmity between us as fallen humanity and a holy God. So as we grow and we begin to process our sin and we see really how far off we are from where we should be, we don't have 
peace. We're at enmity with God. But aren't you thankful that through and by Jesus Christ, we can come out of enmity to peace? You see, through Jesus, we have peace with God. Here's a verse you need to know, Romans 5, 8. The Bible says, Therefore, having been justified by faith. Justified. That's so much more than a television show that we watch every now and then. What does it mean to be justified? To be made clean. To be made as if we have never sinned. Therefore, having been justified by faith, listen to this, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't look over that little prepositional phrase there, with God. Prepositions are important in the Bible. You know what a preposition is? Anywhere a mouse can go, in, through, under, with, that's a preposition. We come out of enmity into peace with God. We have peace with God. Do you remember tonight the, the first time after you were convicted of your sins that you had peace with God? Hmm. Wish we had time for us just to all testify tonight. But since I've got the floor, I'm going to testify. I, I remember in my early childhood beginning to understand what it meant that I was a sinner. You know, people ask me sometimes, well, uh, how old does a child have to be before he or she can be saved? Well, I'm going to tell you, if a child can understand that he or she is a sinner and there's a penalty for that sin, and that Jesus took care of that penalty on the cross. If they can understand those things, they can understand how to be saved. But I remember being that snot-nosed little brat, and, and all of the sudden I felt guilty. And back to what we talked about a little bit this morning, I understood what hell was. And I understood that because of the guilt in my life, that that's where I would go if something didn't get better about my life. And I wrestled with it, and I wrestled with it, and I wrestled with it. I remember one night on a Saturday night, I went to bed and I wet my pillow with my tears not knowing what would happen to me. Well, I didn't know what would happen to me if I didn't wake up to see the light of the next morning. It was a Sunday morning. Dad had already gone over onto the, the church building. My mother and my sister were, were finishing getting ready, and I was sitting in our den at the house watching television, and, and I remember the weight of my sin came upon me like it had never come upon me before. And right there, that Sunday morning, as best I knew how to do it, I said, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. wasn't anybody in the room but me and Jesus. And I said, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I'm guilty before you. And Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. I repent. And Lord Jesus Christ... Would you come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior? And I'm telling you, at that very moment in time, the guilt was gone and I had peace with God. I hope you remember that. Having peace with God. Oh, my friend, there's nothing like having peace with God. Guilt gone, heaven coming, a good life to lead peace with God. That's who we're made to be, right? God created Adam and Eve and He placed them in a beautiful paradise, the Garden of Eden, to have peace with Him, to walk with Him, to talk with Him. Can you imagine what the long line must be in heaven to get a word with Adam and Eve? 
They chose to do what God told them not to do, and all of a sudden, where was the peace? It was gone. But God stepped in, and God provided a way for us to have peace. That's peace with God. And when you have peace with God, you can have the peace of God. See, you can be relationally right with God, but also out of fellowship with God. And when you're out of fellowship with Him, you don't have the peace that He wants you to have. But Jesus said in John 16, right before He would later be arrested and go through His trials and go all the way to Calvary to the cross, He's there in the upper room with His apostles, and He says in John 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in Me you may have peace. Peace. I've given you a word, Jesus said to the apostles. I've spoken this to you so that you may take in this word. Take in the tender grass of my word. And therefore you can have peace with me. That's the peace of God. And then Paul would write to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. He would say that the peace of God which does what, church? That surpasses all understanding. That kind of peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I don't mean to say so much about it, but it's just where I am. It's what Amy and I and our family are living through. People come up to us all the time and just simply ask, how how are you doing it? How do you continue? How do you get out of bed in the morning? How do you face another day? And there's one reason, and one reason only, is that we have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And God wants you to live beside those still waters of peace. Instead of anxiety, instead of worry, through the stress, God wants you to be by the still waters. He leads me beside the still waters. In the Hebrew language, it's literally this, the waters of quietness. We played with that image a little bit last week. Just picture in your mind for a moment that beautiful late spring Kentucky Valley. Down at the end of it is the tranquil spring, the stream that's not rushing. It's just flowing. It's just ebbing by down in the valley. And when you see that, that's exactly what David is describing here. The quiet waters, the waters of quietness. I've told you before, Israel for the most part it's a very rocky, dry, hot, barren place. And what did the shepherd have to do? In addition to leading them to the tableland of the green pastures, he had to take them to the place where the water was quiet. Because sheep won't drink out of a harshly running stream. They're afraid of it. They have to be taken down to that quiet place, that place of peace, that place where they can drink, where they can be satisfied, that place where the shepherd is, that place where they're not afraid. That's where God wants you to be tonight. You see, God doesn't just want you to have peace with Him, but God wants you to experience His peace on a daily basis. And here is the crux of the matter. When you get out of fellowship with God, when you're walking out in front of Him or behind Him or way too far to the right or left and you're not in perfect fellowship with God, 
that's when you're not beside the still waters. That's where you don't experience peace. And the truth of the matter is, we have all been there, right? You ever been in that patch of life where you've decided to do your own thing, go your own way? Let me ask you, how'd that work out for you? Not very well, right? You see, God, again, has created us to have fellowship with Him. And St. Augustine years ago said that there, there's a hole in the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl that can't be filled with anything beside a relationship with the Lord. And it's an amazing thing to me how those of us who experience peace, peace with God, how we want to walk away every now and then and go out on our own, knowing what the end result of that will be when God says all the time, I have a place of peace for you. I have still waters. I have green pastures. And I invite you to come. Do you have the peace of God in your heart and in your life tonight? I'm trusting on a Sunday night as nasty as this day is, you have peace with God. But do you have peace of God? Are you following Him? Are you close to His side? Have you made a decision that's led you out of fellowship with Him? Well, tonight that can be restored. Just a prayer away, just an open heart away, saying, God, I'm sorry for doing this thing that has led me out of fellowship with You. Lord, I'm coming back. I'm coming back home. I'm coming back beside the still waters. Would you stand with me tonight and bow your heads? I'm going to pray for you, and after I pray, we'll sing together a stanza or two of song of invitation, and tonight God invites you to come. Obviously come if you don't have peace with Him. If you've never been saved, come and He will save you tonight. Or perhaps tonight... If you're out of fellowship with Him and you hear His still, small voice calling you back into a right relationship, do you need to come? You don't have to say anything to me. And as I said this morning, we're going to learn it more and more all the time. The, the front of this church is really not an altar. The altar is in your heart. But I'm saying to you tonight, there is something significant. When you step out, and you come to a place before men and before God and just get down on your knees and do business with Him. And perhaps God is calling you to come tonight just to pray out, Lord, uh, forgive me for walking beyond you or falling way back behind you. And Lord, restore me in that relationship with you tonight. If that's what you need to do, that is the place of peace. That's where God calls you. Would you come? Father, we love you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us through your word. And Father, what an amazing word it is, a word that was written under the inspiration of your spirit so many years ago, but a word of relevance for our life tonight. And God, I just pray for my friends here in this room. I pray for anybody here that may not be experiencing peace with you or peace that only you can give, your peace that you want to shower, that peace that passes understanding. Lord, if there's one who needs to come, one who needs to stand there, bow down on bended knee, whatever, Lord, you need us to do, if there's one who needs to come to you, 
and be restored to a place of peace. I pray he or she would come tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing together, if you need to come, would you come? I pray we all leave here tonight, if not experiencing the perfect peace of God, knowing how we get there. And so I I just ask you tonight, if you don't have peace with God, you know the starting place. Give your heart and your life to Jesus. If you don't have the peace of God, that might mean there's an area of your life you just need to surrender. Just say, God, I give up. I give it to you. It's yours. He can handle it a lot better than we can. So I encourage you to do that tonight. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful week. It's going to be a good one. It will be a good one. And He will lead us and He will use us in remarkable ways this week. So leave here tonight uh, not being depressed, but being full of joy with a spring in your step and a twinkle in your eye because He leads us to those beautiful places of green pasture and right down beside the still waters. Give Him glory with your life this week as He leads us as our shepherd. But Charles, lead us in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for speaking to our hearts this evening. Lord, I just pray that you'll truly search our hearts for any hidden rooms that we've kept from you, Lord, that we might truly experience your peace and truly enter into your rest. And we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.